Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this new week, as we return into our study in Judges, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that we are about to read and their import for us today. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you today and we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to open your word so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that are before us and that that you would have us to know for this time not only in this earth's history, but in the preparation of this movement. I thank you for each one that is joining in this meeting today. Help us each one that we may understand the symbols and their import and all that you need us to know at this time. May your Holy Spirit be with us so that our minds may be enlightened. May your angels attend us so that we may breathe that of the air of heaven as we are searching your scripture to try to understand more, not only for this time, but for us personally. Please direct us now, guide us, in this study, in this conversation, and in all things. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we have some rather interesting anniversaries today. Today is the 21st anniversary of the attack on the World Trade Center in New York and the attack on the Pentagon and the attack, the attempted attack on the White House. Twenty one years. Since Islam has come into focus in the national and world mindset. Three, seven times since this attack. It is also 42 years since Glacier View. Um, Glacier View was in August. No, I'm, I'm just saying in years, 42 years, 42 since, years. Yeah. since Glacier View, where those that viewed themselves as being biblical scholars began a work contrary to that of scripture. <clears throat> now, As we are looking here, we are returning into Judges 11, the last portion of the book. As we had been looking, we have Jephthah. Jephthah returns from his battle against the Moabites. He has made a vow. As he has made this vow, it is his daughter that comes to meet him. He had vowed that whatever met him from the doors of his house, he would sacrifice, commit to the Lord. 
And his daughter said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for, for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Anna. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down, or go and go down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. Now, did we establish what the two months symbol is? Did we come to an agreement on it? I don't, I don't know if we came to an agreement. I had some suggestions. And those suggestions were? Well, so one is it represents 60 days. Okay. And, and 60 days is 1,440 hours. Okay. So a symbol of the 144,000. Right. Yeah. And then we also have, if I took this 60 and I multiplied it in, as weeks, so I'm taking a, a day for a week, and I count from July 18, uh, 2020, um, that, and I'm just going to use, uh, so let me see here. I can't remember which dates they came up to, but um, so if I multiply uh, 60 times 7, I'm going to get um, 420 days, right? So I can count 420 days from uh, that, and I come to September 11th, 2021. So that's one year ago today. I come to that date as a symbol. So that's going to be... Uh, a date that at least is a symbol of uh, that's connected to July 18th, right? Because they're both attacks, at least uh, in our prediction, was an attack by Islam. Um, there were some other ones, um, which I can't particularly remember. If anybody remembers them, there was quite a few other ones. That, uh, I had said that maybe the 60 days could be two periods of 30 years, like from 1989 to 2019. Yeah. And I forget the other one. I think it was uh, 2001 to, no, I don't remember yeah. now. Sorry. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, to November, the November 9th, the two periods of 777 yeah. days. So, each of those are 30 years. And so there's two of the 1991 to 2021 that was the other one yeah yeah um so that uh and uh steven do you remember any of the other ones he said something about 49 years uh, not offhand, no. Oh, you're talking about else. Yeah. Um, so, oh, well, the two months is also a doubling. Um, so that was the other thing. <laughs> so it's mentioned three times, judges. So why the three times? Now that's puzzling. Yeah. <clears throat> And okay, so there was four hundred twenty days, so twenty years, September eleventh. Um. Um, I'm just looking over at the transcript from last time. Oh, uh, the other one was August 22nd to October 22nd. Stephen had brought up. Okay. Right? So that's a symbol from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. 
which which I think is actually a really uh, a really interesting one. Also, if we take thirty days in a month, right? So we're going to take these two months and we multiply sixty by thirty, we get eighteen hundred. And if we count from July 18, 2020, that's going to bring us to June 22nd, 2025. So the significance there is that's a symbol of this movement. So not, not that we're predicting anything on those types of dates, but um, <clears throat> we can use it um, in that way. And it's also June 9th, Julian, which of course we know is um, the date that we mark time setting in this movement, which happens, of course, it's always June 9th, Julian is June 22nd, Gregorian. Um, and uh, on the Mayan calendar, it's uh, 13, 0, 12, 12, 6. We have the 12, 6, uh, the 126 there at the end, the last two digits. So, so there's a lot of symbols that can be drawn from this, that when we look at them in the way that we've looked at numbers before, uh, they give us symbols of this movement and of the predictions that we have made, of the time prophecies that we have made. So it points to the 144,000, it points to FFA, it points to uh, time setting in this movement, and it points to midnight cry to the Sunday law, as well as connecting uh, the two periods of 777 days. Any other thoughts on that? I'm thinking back to when when the Passover reforms were being reinstated, so to speak, and they said they couldn't have the Passover in the first month, so they had it in the second month. I was wondering if that has any link to what we're studying. Yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting. Yeah, so that's Second Chronicles 29. Um, yeah, and when they make an invitation to northern Israel. Now we also have then, so that's just the two months, but it's in these two months that they, that she says that she may go up and down upon the mountains, um, her and her friends. And this going up and down on the mountains as, uh, I mean, the word is halak, I believe, to go, which means to walk, to walk and descend upon the mountains is what it literally would be. And to bewail my virginity, which I think we just started touching at a little bit. We know that it has to do with the 144,000 being the final generation. Any other thoughts on this? Is that satisfactory? Yes, I had one. I had one in Luke about Anna. Of course, now I can't locate it. <laughs> Uh, it was Luke chapter one, was it not? I think no. so, or was it chapter two? Maybe. Darn it. Where are my notes? Yeah. Oh, it's uh, Luke 2, 37 to 39. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. Okay. Sounds 84, which departed not from the temple, and, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord to speak of him to all that look for redemption in Jerusalem. Okay, so I'm saying like a dedication to God, like strict dedication to God, I guess is what I was talking about. She departed not from the temple. So that's a dedication right there. Yeah. Well, in verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity. So I think that's where you got the connection. 
Yeah, and Faniel means the uh, face of God, right? Am I correct? Penuel and Faniel are the same word? Uh, Faniel? Yeah, is Is the same word as what? Well, Pen Penuel and Faniel, are they the same word? Like one's Hebrew, one's Greek? Um, a Greek uh, version of the Hebrew. Well, let me, let me look. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, this is in Greek. Um, so, um, yeah, it's penuel. Yeah, it's the same word. It's just a uh, recognized uh, transliteration of it, in, and then back into English or into English. <clears throat> Well, four score and four years, you have 84, and that's on the chart. So yeah, I know. yeah, I know. So you have the 84, and then you have the seven. You have that on the chart. Yep. Right? So seven times 12 uh -huh. is 84. Right. So, so obviously, we can connect this in some way to um, this story. Um, any other thoughts on that? Anyone? Anna is just Hannah, right? Right. It means grace. Mm -hmm. Dwight? Okay. <clears throat> so... The daughter is basically telling her, her father to fulfill his vow to God. Right. Because God has taken vengeance, has provided the vengeance against the enemies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, Jephthah says, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. <clears throat> and it was a custom or an ordinance in Israel. Yeah, it was an ordinance in Israel that they would, on four days out of the year, they would lament the daughter of Jephthah. But I believe we established very directly from Scripture, this does not mean that she was sacrificed on an altar. Right. It's just her virginity that was being mourned. Right. <clears throat> So she went from here then to serve in the temple. Would that be an understanding? That's that's what I would think uh, would this vow would be about. Now, what kind of a symbol would we have from this? I mean, we have the symbols here of the 144,000. And we know the 144,000 serve in the temple. And they're a special class um, that, uh, I mean, symbolically, they're virgins, right? They're the final generation. They're not going to have any progeny. Right. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so, final generation. making its word known upon the mountains. So what would we use as a symbol of the mountains? Well, normally we would use a kingdom, but my suggestion was that the mountains represent prophecy in that we know that mountains are a common symbol in, in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. 
Um, I don't know if there's any thoughts on that. Could, could we take mountains and use them as a symbol of a prophecy that we're going up, going and descending upon the mountains has to do with the study of prophecy? Yes, it makes perfect sense. And also the verse that comes to me is in Isaiah 2 about the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established, the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. Mm -hmm. And and one thing we can see is that if we're if we're applying this correctly in the time within this movement, it's going to be studying uh the seven kings. Or or the no. Yeah, the, the seven heads, which are seven mountains that are seven kings in Revelation 17, correct? Amen. Okay, so, so going up and down on the mountains would be examining that prophecy specifically. And, and we have done that, have we not? So, um, now what about the four days in a year that they're going to lament? So, um, and we'll probably come back to that other verse there, but it talks about, uh, that it was the custom. It was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite four days in a year. What, what can we gather from these four days? What does that represent? And, and why is it four days in a year? It seems like an odd thing. They may be four chief waymarks. 9-11, midnight, midnight, Friday, Sunday law. Okay, so we have those four way marks. First day of the first 18, 11, 9, 6, 22, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so, yeah, and, and that's a year, right? So we have this symbol of a year, um, which is the period of time that we have in the story of Ezra. They have one year from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. 457 to 456 it's given this period of time and we know that that line uh, parallels with the line in Millerite history and we have four principal way marks that we have in that line now it's interesting that Jeff prior to having the symbol of midnight he had three way marks that he always would mark he would always put three way marks up on a line even when those way marks changed you know, 1989, um, uh, the Sunday law and the close of probation had that line at one time. Uh, once we had 9-11, that'd be uh, 1989, 9-11 and the close of probation. But eventually by 2016, we had added this midnight way mark. So now we have four way marks. So it's four days in a year that um, that they're going to lament the daughter of Jephthah. Uh, so welcome back, Dwight. So um, when we look at this, so what we did is we, we looked at this, uh, the four days, the okay. lamentations, and, and, I, and, and Angela suggested that it represents the four way marks that we have in a year, the first day of the first month, fifth day of the fourth month, first day of the fifth month, and the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay. Now, if, and we talked about the mountains as well. So going up and down upon the mountains is examining the prophecy of Revelation 17, which we okay. have had in this context. And, and also this lamentation, that's the four days in a year, um, we, we, we only, not only can we look in Millerite history for those four dates, but what dates are we given in 457 BC that mark the line? 
I mean, we've given quite a few dates there. But we're given the first day of the first month, correct? All right, agreed. Uh, we're given uh, the first day of the 12th month. The first day of the fifth month. That? What's that? Third day of the 12th month. Wasn't it? Oh, pardon me. Twelfth day of the first month. I said it backwards. Oh, <laughs> first day of the first month. Twelfth day of the first month. Uh, first day of the fifth month, and the twentieth day of the ninth month. All right. That's going to mark this period of time. Now, of course, they're going to have that divorce that happens from the first day of the tenth month to the first day of the first month. But really, it gives us these four dates. In that, that are marking are being marked specifically. So, so we have this four days in a year. And, and one of the things that we have done, uh, would this not be an examination of the lines, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I was going to say like going up and down is like running to and fro, which is mm -hmm. studying the word. Yeah. But, but also the four, four days in a year, this is an examination of the lines, understanding the lines, which is what this study is about. So could we, we, could we make that analogy that this is, uh, that the fulfillment of the vow, this vow regarding the prediction of July 18, 2020, has with it um, a sacrifice that has to be made. And that sacrifice is the study of the prophecies, the re-examination of the prophecies, as Ellen White counseled us for us to follow that example that they followed in 1850. Does that seem reasonable at all? Didn't they, didn't they, Very didn't they follow that from October 23rd, 1844 through to 1850? Um, well, yeah, specifically it was in 1850 though. That's when they came together and when she talks about how they studied, that was more in 1850. It, I mean, yeah, different people were studying, but they came together, those, that group of people that produced the 1850 chart. Okay. Yeah, so that was in 1850. In my understanding of it, it wasn't earlier. Because at that time, they became more and more separated from the other Adventists. Right. So they were being led away to be separated. So yeah. the, the point that I'm trying to make <clears throat> mm -hmm. is in that time frame, from the Great Disappointment to 1850, as they were becoming more and more separated from the other Adventists, would this also not be another type of symbol of the two months where Jephthah's daughter and her friends are then separated from her father's house. Okay, explain it a little bit more. Right? Well, I, I missed a step. Okay, Jephthah's daughter sought to bewail her virginity for a period of two months, she and her friends. Mm -hmm. Now we've accepted that she is a representation of a church. The friends are like-minded. Otherwise they would not have all been friends. Mm -hmm. They are all leaving for a, a, a period of time of two months. Yeah, and, and, and of course, this is the virginity has to do with the symbol of the 144,000. Right. Those that remained after October 23rd, 1844, those 50, mm -hmm. became more and more separated from the other churches and specifically from the Millerite Adventists. Yeah, it happened gradually uh, from, from October 23rd, but... Yeah, it, the, that gradual separation occurred. So we're dealing <clears throat> with this situation where as they became more separated, they came to a clearer understanding 
of what was going on, and that led to the 1850 chart. Mm -hmm. So by the time they are ready to produce the 1850 chart, it's almost as if they are then returning to their father's house. I'm just looking at this entirely symbolically, but mm -hmm. applying the history with the symbols. Yeah. So, is that possible? Yes. So, I mean, definitely we can apply it to Millerite history um, because we're repeating Millerite history and we're right. repeating that history. So, so I, I think we could do that. Um, though we're primarily making the application here to our history. Right. But in order to be able to make it to our history, we have to have the foundation in the Millerite history. Right. Yeah. So we have the foundation in Millerite history. We also have it in the story of, of Ezra in 457. Um, and so this vow then, is is related to what specifically about the July 18, 2020 prediction do we equate then with the vow? Is it the warning of Nashville? I would think so. Yeah, because it's in that it act itself. It's not so much about predicting July 18, 2020 that becomes the vow. It's the warning of Nashville. It's this... Um, I can't think of a word for it, but well, it's not like a test, but it's, um, I mean, what he's doing here when he's making this vow, he's making an agreement with God, but it's not just that he's asking God to do something and that he's then going to do something else, which it does happen but it has to do with the interchange that's occurring. It's the type of faith that he's showing. And, and in a sense, it's, um, it's like the sign of Gideon and, and the fleeces, right? And, and in some ways we can actually look at the fleeces as these predictions that we made. But now he's going to warn, or we're going to warn Nashville. And, but there is a consequence with that. And many people didn't want to accept the consequence because they're embarrassed. People wouldn't have minded July 18th if we had just kept it to ourselves and it never happened. Right? Right. But the fact is that we were telling people about it and publicly making ourselves look foolish. That was the problem that people had. You know, November 9th didn't have that public sort of uh, embarrassment attached to it. Plus also by the time we got to November 9th, this movement wasn't looking for any event other than internal. But when we get to July 18th, we now take action. And, and that's the thing that people had prom, problems with. And, and the consequences of that is, that is that we now are being placed in a situation that is a greater sacrifice than we recognized, both in what happened when nothing happened on July 18, 2020, but also what is followed afterwards. Does that seem reasonable? It's logical. Okay. <clears throat> and so this lamentation of for the daughter of Jephthah is both of these things. So we're, we're going up and down upon the mountains. And can we agree that that's the study of Revelation 17?
I think that that's an example. Okay, because because it would be prophecy in general, but I think very specifically, this is an examination of the Trump prediction. Okay, please expand on that. Well, that's why we looked at Revelation 17, because of what Colin was saying about Trump. So we examined this prediction, right? We didn't just dismiss right. it. We looked at it. We went up and down upon it. We went and descended upon the mountains. We looked at this prophecy inside out. We examined it. And now this is a period of two months, some kind of symbol. Now these two months, um, you know, we have all these different symbols, a time setting, um, uh, September 11th, um, June 22nd, um, 144,000, all these different symbols that are tied up with these two months, uh, August 22nd to October 22nd. Um, so if we, if we look at that, and then we look at the four, day, four days in a year, which is an examination of the lines, this is exactly what we have been doing in this time period, because this would be representing the time period after July 18th, after he returns home and sees the consequences of his vow. Right. And, and when would we mark that? When does the message return home? Like, I mean, he comes back from this battle that he's won and he's going to come to the door. Um, you know, well, he's going to come to his house and the thing that comes out of the door of his house to meet him is his daughter. So when is that? What, what date would we place that as occurring? I hadn't considered a direct date. Okay. What if I said December 6th, uh, 2020? Would that make any sense to anyone? I, I'm not saying it's the correct date. But if I said that date, well, how would we understand uh, this, um, right? Whatsoever that cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me. So the question is, what is his house and what are the doors of his house? I remember well the events of December 6th of 2020. Okay. But because of the application. I think it more. Go ahead, Dwight. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say that matches more with with uh, the second verse. Gilead's wife bare him, bare him two sons. Their sons and sons grew up. They thrust out Jephthah, weren't we thrust out by FFA, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Okay, so That's when my... yeah, so the way that we applied this is. The thrusting out of Jephthah was the earlier thrusting out of the message of July 18th, prior to uh, Parminder's rebellion, or the recognition of his rebellion, right? So we would place this in early, well, maybe even late 2018. That's when Jephthah's thrust, thrust out. And then he's going to be invited back. The message of July 18th is invited back, right? After Parminder's rebellion, correct? All right. So, so I don't think that we could take that first part and put it to December 6th, 2020, because this, this, this is a progression of what happens in this movement. So the message of July 18th is given, Jephthah is born, Right. But then he's going to be cast out, but then he's going to be called back. 
And that's going to be before July 18th. Right. And so Jephthah is the message of July 18th. But connected to this is this vow. And this vow is, is what happens with the prediction of Nashville, of the publication of that prediction specifically. So, so what I'm asking is when does he return, um, when he returns and what cometh forth from the door of his house, the doors of his house to meet him. Um, now he makes this vow, but it happens. So I'm not so much when the vow was made, because I believe that the vow is the prediction regarding Nashville. But then the consequences of that is, can, can we put a date upon it? Where there's, where this, um, I mean, maybe we put that at July 18th. I don't know, but my suggestion was it's December 6, 2020. Because if we're going to look at the doors of the house, what is the house representing here? Wouldn't that be FFA? That would be an interesting symbol. And the doors represent a turning point, something that swings on a hinge. Right? That's what the Hebrew word means. And, and it's a plural, not a singular. Um, well, yes, it's the it's a plural here. It's not. Uh, let me see here, just to make sure. Um, just look directly at the Hebrew. Well, there's more than one door, so. Yeah, um, just hang on. Yeah, the door is in my house. Okay. I'm just uh, thinking um, December 6th, you were cast out. Yeah. And then it was two months. Then we had January the 6th. Okay. And, since, and then we had February the 6th, which was your birthday. Yeah. I was cast out. I it was like two months there. Yeah, you were cast out on my birthday? Yes, because I text you that the FFA had exited me from their chat. Okay. And you said that was your birthday present. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry for laughing there, but uh, okay, yeah. So it's uh, it's a feminine plural, um, and and it's it's uh, mem dalit, and the word dalit actually is the word door. So the letter D is the word door. And the, but anyway, lamed and 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 tav, and then it's got a yod at the end. So that's from the doors in the feminine form of my house. His doors are feminine. Um, and it says my house, my doors, my house, literally. Okay. Is that? Okay. So the reason, the reason I ask about the plural. Yeah. By that point, by December 6th, Elder Jeff was no longer speaking. Mm -hmm. He had, had made the decision that he was the leper outside the camp. Yeah. So that is a door. Mm -hmm. The other door being that FFA made their decision to begin removing anything that many of us had to say. Okay. Now, The decision they made regarding myself was that because I was willing to stand with you, with Stephen, on many of these things, but specifically with you, that 
I was no longer welcome in their chat. Mm -hmm. They made their decision way before December 6th regarding you. Mm -hmm. And then they made their decision regarding Stephen after December 6th. Yeah. Well, February 6th. Right. But I mean, with Stephen, there's there's your period of two months, right? Yeah. yeah. So another period of two months. Uh, and the decision, bottom, but literally, yeah. The decision with you was made about two months before December 6th. Yeah, why did they make it so early? I have, their, their whole thought process was they wanted nothing further to do with July 18th and they saw you as the promoter of the issue with July 18th. Mm -hmm. So what I'm what I'm saying is they made the decision with you. I was in the middle, and then here's Stephen. Mm -hmm. Now, as a pattern, that's kind of interesting because then they would be wanting to set aside anything having to do with Samuel Snow. They wanted nothing to do with midnight. And they wanted nothing to do with the midnight cry, symbolized by the two months when they when they took Stephen off the chat. Yeah. Okay. So so it is pretty interesting how this fits together. Yes. Um. And I hadn't really thought it through. It was just an, an intuition sort of uh, suggestion. So now that we have, now that he comes home and he has to fulfill this vow, there's going to be this time of study. So his daughter, which represents more the movement than anything, um, but the movement studying, right? Because the right. message of July 18th, um, even though it was correct, it wasn't correct in, in, in its prediction, but it was correct in its chronology. He now has this um, sacrifice that he has to make. And this sacrifice is going to be seen in study, right? And this, this is where we see that many people aren't interested in making this sacrifice. Right. We hear it's too hard or it needs to be made simpler, right? But it's it, you know it's it also ties back in with what we were addressing yesterday, because the laziness you're talking about. Of yes, the, I am. Yeah, of the Cottrell's. Yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting to see how all these things come together. I mean, it gets really interesting in Judges chapter 12, the first part of it, and, and what's following this. Agreed. Dealing with Ephraim. Um, and, and I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, so we have this message of Jephthah, July 18th. We have this studying that follows, this sacrifice that's made, and, and we have all of the symbols that are attached to this movement okay, at, now, at present, at our prediction. Yep. Two comments from the chat. Asking if we were saying Judges 1130 and 31 were equivalent to, Col to Collins' conviction that Trump would regain the presidency. I don't know that I would agree with that. Um, well, the reason I put it is because it was a rash vow. It's a very rash vow. Yeah. So That's you, the only connotation. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I, I haven't interpreted it that way. That this vow is okay. the prediction of, of July 18th, and the vow itself is 
the delivering of the message publicly in the Tennessean that Nashville would be hit by a nuclear attack by Islam. Um, and I, I don't know if I see this as a rash vow of Jephthah's vow. No, I thought that you were saying that Colin saying that, oh, Trump is going to regain the presidency was very rash. And so I thought, well, Ellen White even said that that was Jephthah's rash vow, right? And I thought, okay, in that way it fits. Okay. But I agree with what you're saying. She, she mentions Jeff's, Jephthah's rash vow? Yeah, I'm almost certain I read that that it was a rash vow, but you can confirm it by checking because it's been quite a while. Since I, couldn't there, find, I couldn't find anything other than her quoting Rome, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah, there's um, there's almost nothing about Jephthah in the, in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Except for the quote out of the faith chapter. Yeah, I, I don't think she mentions anything about uh, rash. Mm, I know I read it somewhere. Maybe it was a comment by somebody else then, but I'm almost 100% positive. I read that it was described as a rash vow. Yeah, she doesn't. She or, doesn't I, I can't find my it. memory is so inaccurate sometimes, but. Hmm. I mean, there are rash That's vows that are made. Thoughts. Yeah, there are rash vows that she refers to by others, but not. Because she only refers to Jephthah seven times um, in on the E.G. White disc, and and each one of those is just a quote from Hebrews chapter eleven. Uh, okay, well one, I don't know who said it, but I know I read it somewhere. Um, she does. Uh, let me see here. It is actually mentioned in. She mentions a deliverer was raised up in person of Jephthah, a Gileadite who made war upon the Ammonites. But she doesn't say anything about his vow. And she just says for 18 years at this time had suffered under of the oppression of her foes. So, but otherwise every other quote is just from, Yeah, and, and it's really just a couple of times. It's all just repetition of the same thing. Really, she quotes, she, she mentions him twice. Okay, I'm going to find out where I read it. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Doors is a doubling, Ron asks. Right. And so the plural of doors, is it possible that that, could be a symbol of a doubling or the second angel's message. Um, well, the plural is not a dual. So, so I don't know. I mean, it is a plural, but it's not a dual plural. It's just a plural plural because they do have a dual in Hebrew. Um, okay. Hmm. So, so then we have that the daughters of Israel went yearly or went from year to year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. Now we used, as the translators had, Judges 5.11. But pardon me, it is actually the dual plural, doors. Okay. So it is a doubling. So that would be correct then. Very nice pickup, Ron. Mm -hmm. So the feminine dual. So. The feminine dual. So that's doubling of churches? Well, door, doors are just feminine. I mean, I, I don't know if I would make much but that's why it's it's um kind of fooled me i'm not i'm not an expert on some of this hebrew grammar but um but i'm looking at uh basically it's uh um it's it's in my uh, scholar's gateway so that you just click on the word and it'll give you the breakdown of the word the parsing of it so yeah so it's a feminine dual noun <clears throat> okay.
All right, so what would be seen as being important of the daughters of Israel went yearly to talk with the daughter of Jephthah. Why is that something we should know? Okay, so this to me, the daughters of Israel, these, this represents the church, the movement, and it's going to lament the daughter of Jephthah, that is, in four days in a year. So the idea was that this represents the lines, the four way marks, the first day of the first month, fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month. So, which is what we're doing right now, examining the lines. Right. So the four days in a year represent those four way marks. And this lamentation of the daughter of Jephthah has to do with the what has happened in the movement. And now we have to study. So it's just another way in which we're looking at something that we're studying. The first one where they go down, up and down upon the mountains is an examination of Colin's prediction, right? Because that is represented primarily in, in Revelation 17, where we have the seven heads or seven mountains, which are seven kings. And, and in here we have the four days in a year. This is examine our understanding the lines, which is what we're doing now. So we've done both of these things in this time that are symbolically represented. We've looked at thoroughly at the Trump prediction, and we've also thoroughly looked at and examined the lines. And we're still doing that. So we're fulfilling this prophecy. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Any other ways in which we could look at these four days in a year, this lamentation of the daughter of Jephthah? Well, okay. When I'm looking at the lamentation, when I'm looking at the, the four days in the year, I'm, I'm looking also back at the two months because the daughters of Israel come to talk with the daughter of Jephthah four days in a year. In other words, they're seeking to console her, to see how she is doing. But what is she learning from her service in the temple? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and why is it, I mean, and specifically it's four days, so we're not sure. Is it during the feasts or something? Right. Or is it all at one time? Well, no, four days in a year. I think it's four different periods of time. Okay. I mean, I'm, that's what that's the way I see it. Uh, okay. Yeah, different times, four days in a year. Um, is the way that it's understood. So the daughters of Israel went yearly, that says yearly, um, but that it doesn't actually say yearly in Hebrew, right? It says day to day. Now they say they're from year to year, um, but but that's because they're trying to put it in a sense that would make sense in, in English. Um, but in Hebrews, it's yom uh, that's used, which is the word day. So if it is yom, I mean, I, I don't know the adjective of, you know, or how we would, how we would combine this, but if we're going to go day to day, yeah, okay, so I'm looking at a problem here in, so I got the e-sort, right? Got it. And it's giving me misinformation. So it says here they went 
if you look at, um, you know, it says yearly and it has uh, the word, it's just the mem. It just means from. And then it's going to have Hebrew 3117 and then it repeats it. 3117. All right. All right. So, so you have these, um, it, it looks like day to day. But when I actually look at the Hebrew manuscript, um, it doesn't say that. It says um, days in the year. Uh, let me see here. See, I don't, oh, oh, never mind. It does say that. I'm looking at the wrong spot. So they just have the sentence all mixed up in Hebrew. That's why. <laughs> um, yeah, because in Hebrew, the first two words of that sentence are uh, days, days. So it actually says here, literally in Hebrew, uh, from days, from days, um, went, um, went uh, the daughters of Israel, um, to celebrate or lament or rehearse, so that word there, uh, the daughter of Jephthah and um, the Gileadite. Uh, then it says Arba, which is four, uh, four, four days in the year. Okay, so, so at the beginning there, it does say uh, from days, from days to days, not from year to year. Anyway, that's the I guess the main point. Sorry, it took so long to figure that out. So when when you're looking at this Hebrew three one one seven, yeah, and Judges eleven forty, yeah, the sentence structure would be a little strange. Yes, mm -hmm. because it would be miyamin yamima. Right. I'm looking at a Hebrew interlinear Bibles. Yeah, so it's it's saying it from day to day, from days to days. That's what it's it literally would be translated. Okay. But that word appears three times in the one verse. Yeah, because it says four days uh, in the year. So they're going to go from days to days. The daughters will go out and do this uh, four days in the year. So, so the expression days to days means yearly, but the word year isn't there in that expression is all I'm trying to say. Because okay. they put here, the Hebrew says from year to year, but it doesn't. It's, it says from day, days to days. Okay. Right. So just just to be clear on that, that, that the word days is used. The significance of that to me has to do with how we have been addressing um, events after July 18th. What have we been doing? Studying day by day. Yeah, we're, we're looking at, as we going through this history, we're looking at events that are popping up, these different dates, and we're counting from one day to the next, these spans of time. And, and the context of this is marking these waymarks, which the four days in a year represent. These four principal waymarks that occur from within the second angel's message, I guess is how we would look at it. Both the arrival of the second angel, its formalization, its empowerment, and finally the arrival of the third that marks the end of the second angel's message. So this is describing exactly what this movement has been experiencing. Would, would we agree with that? I and think it shows it very clearly. And, and we're addressing these. And, and if we want to look at it another way, I mean, we have the mountains, which represents Revelation 17. Collins prediction, but also we have these spans of time, which 
which Odilio has done in his predictions. Right. So this represents both an examination of, of Colin's understanding and also of Odilio's understanding. But also this is what we are examining. We're examining the lines, we're examining, and we're, we're recognizing that there isn't a lot wrong with what's being presented. The only problem is the conclusion. Well, I shouldn't say the only problem. There are some, some interpretation parts of that, why they draw that conclusion. But, but primarily, the ideas aren't, aren't wrong. It's not based upon some false premise. It's just based upon some misapplications of points. And the reason those misapplications occur is because they're not examining things the way that we're examining them. We're being much more diligent. One is it's open study, even though, you know, it's mostly me talking, but, you know, everybody's allowed to have a say. And we openly look at what other people are studying. You know, not, not from a critical point of view trying to find fault, but from uh, a point of view of trying to understand what, what is truth. So I think that this, this describes what we're doing and it would affirm that our approach is the correct one. Okay. So comment again from the chat that the understanding of the line study started December 26th of 2021. Okay. Yeah, and, and that was in connection because what happened on December 25th, uh, Stephen had come to see a particular point. What was that point, Stephen, that you noticed on December 25th that was extremely important? Yes, it uh, tied in the two Lamics to Daniel's. Well, you, you already had recognize this here's a two lamics tied in with uh, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 the 70 week prophecy yeah then with with that there both of them lamics connected in years connected it uh, to the Constantine yeah so seven law and three yeah it was 777 years yes from 457 to Constantine seven yeah. Sunday law yeah, and this helped us understand what where we were in the lines when we got to December 25th, 2021. It showed us clearly that um, that we were correct and that these lines, a lot of the dates in these lines, and I don't know if I've made this clear, but um, a lot of these dates have to do not just with, you know, way marks within the, in the movement, but also increases of light. That is, when we pass some of these way marks, we are given very specific light that guides our feet. And the whole principle of this, um, I've of course talked about, when we pass over fulfilled prophecy, those events will shine light back upon the past events, and those events will then shine light forward. I have a hard time finding that quote again, because I always use the wrong word. So every time I search it, I can never find it, but it's in the spirit of prophecy. Um, I believe it's in selected messages, but, um, but this is what happened on December 25th with that understanding. And so now we had an understanding of 321. And we went on to understand even more about 321 AD and the Sunday Law as we continued our study with the Book of Esther. Okay, one of the other comments that was put in the chat was Isaiah 65, 23. Now, what does that have to do with what we're addressing here? Um, Ron quoted it there. So, yeah, it's just like we're students of the word and it's drawing us closer to God. We're unifying to do this. So that's what I wanted to emphasize. It's just a, an affirmation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our labor is not in vain. 
Yeah, also just another consideration there with uh, 321, mm -hmm. December 25th. December 25th, it was uh, 187 years then from 321 to 508. And there we recognized December 25th there by the baptism yeah. Yeah. of Clovis. And yeah. then it was 479 years to 800 AD with the, uh, the crowning by Pope whatever, on uh, Christmas Day. So that was December 25th again. Yeah. And if you add 457 four, and 187 is 666. Yeah. So that was Charlemagne being uh, made emperor. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. December 25th. Yeah. So these December 25th, the symbols of the Sunday law. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot that we still have to put together about December 25th that we haven't, I mean, we've drawn some lines, but we haven't, we haven't fleshed out that understanding. Yeah, I did, uh, is it 25th, December 25th, when the, they had that uh, small bomb in Nashville too? Yeah, in 2020, yeah. 2020. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, December 25th obviously shows up um, in, in all these major lines, shows up in my life personally, because that's when I'm baptized, December 25th, 1982. Um, so, so these symbols are attached to this movement, but we also know that in the story of Ezra, we attach the 20th day of the ninth month uh, to that. And we also have the December 25th, well, it's not December, it's the 25th day of the 12th month, when Jehoiachin is released from prison. And, and so, so there's a lot more about this December 25th that we've seen, but we haven't really put it all together in a comprehensive package where we've, we've explained it all in one place. And that's something that you know, we need to do, not just, not just drawing the lines with the dates, but actually understanding how they all relate to each other in this Sunday Law prediction. Um, because one of the things that we see is that this movement is typical of the Sunday law, like, like the events that are happening in our lines are typical of what's going to happen in the Sunday law. That is everything here is pointing to the Sunday law in a sense, we're in the Sunday law way mark, but zoomed in, um, so that we see more detail. Um, it's Dwight. Um, yep. Are we going to go to chapter 12 then of Judges? Yeah, we've got a few minutes to um, to address some points from it. Yeah, because in Judges chapter 12, uh, the first part they're dealing with Ephraim is uh, something I think we need to understand because it's it's right before us. I mean, we're, we're, I guess maybe we're in the thick of it. So to speak. We're definitely in the thick of this one. Yeah. So, th so this other stuff has been passed, and and see, and just kind of going over that because when I first went through and read all of this, and I looked at the vow, as I said, the vow was the thing that troubled me the most, because I I just couldn't place it. I was I was trying to put it as something future. Um, and I can't remember how I finally saw it, but uh, um. It, it, when I saw it, it was just everything fell into place. So it was very, very nice in that way. But when we look at Judges 12, then we see that there is this conflict that it occurs. And I think that's what we're in the thick of right now between these two messages. Pretty much exactly. Yeah. So the overview that the translators had used tells us that the Ephraimites quarrel with Jephthah are smitten by the Gileadites and being discerned by the word Shibboleth are slain in great number. Jephthah dies. Ibzan, how had 30 sons and 30 daughters judgeth Israel. After him, Elon and Abdon, who had 40 sons and 30 nephews. Now, Jephthah, 
the Gileadite was of what tribe? Uh, well, he was of the tribe of Manasseh. So where we have the Manasseh, the Manassites and the Ephraimites quarreling, mm -hmm. we have the two half tribes, mm -hmm. the heritage of Joseph quarreling among themselves. Does the heritage of Joseph represent the movement in Toto? Yes, we, we understood that back in 2016. Okay. Yeah. Along with the fact that Ezekiel represents the movement and in 2017 clearly established that snow represents the movement. So, so these are messages within these movements. Right. And the Ephraimites are having this quarrel with uh, the tribe of Manasseh. Right. That's on the east side, Jordan. So I'm going to show my ignorance. How do you uh, pronounce that word? She, she, uh, the, um, they said by the word she, Shibboleth. Shibboleth. Is it yeah. Shibboleth? Okay. Yeah. And the Ephraimites couldn't say Shibboleth. They could only say okay. Sibylet. They oh, okay. could pronounce the CH. <clears throat> like when sometimes people try to say Theodore, they say Theodore. You know, the Theodore. Theodore, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So, what we're going to look at in much detail, since we have just a few minutes remaining here today. But we're going to have to look at this situation because the word shibboleth must be a message. And so my question would be, is this the message of Trump? Well, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I have a view on that. <laughs> okay. Um, which we're going to have to look at tomorrow. But um, it, I don't think it's the message of Trump. I think it's actually the message that we are to give right um so it's not it's not about trump it's about something else the point um, being yeah. that the movement has been raised up to clearly give the message of the three angels of revelation 14 and the other angel of revelation 18 which we call the message of righteousness by faith the message of Trump does not have anything to do with righteousness by faith. Right. So it is a distraction of that message that we are supposed to be preparing to give. Yeah. Okay. Now, remember when Jesus talks about that no uh, dot or tittle? shall be removed from the law. Right. Now, when you take the word shibboleth, in Hebrew, it's it's the shin, uh, is, it's um, the second last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And if the dot, and I always forget which where side the dot's on, I think if it's on the right side, it's a sh, and if it's on the left side, it's pronounced s. Um, but it could be the other way around. Um, but this is, to me, this shibboleth represents a moving of a dot. Well, I think we're going to have to discuss that in a little more detail. Yeah. But the idea here is that this has to do with the interpretation of prophecy, not, not some specific prophecy itself. Well, in our, situ yeah. in, our, in our situation right now, this first verse, I think, is very telling. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? and didst not call us to go with thee. We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. 
Yeah, so, um, so we know that this is a false accusation, right? First off, because they did actually call them, but they didn't come. Right. And, and that word northward, that's actually, I think it's, they went to Z Z Zaphon. It's actually a place, not a direction here. But okay. anyway, we'll, we'll look at that later. Because um, it is the word Zaphon, which, which we know is one of the cities we've looked at. It means hidden, right? Um, but that's where we get the word north from, right? Okay. It's the dark used only of the north as a quarter, gloomy and unknown. Um, so, but I think this is Zaphon, but it, it, whether it's Zaphon or not, it's still the symbol of the word northward, means or, that it's something hidden. I think that, I think it is Zaphon. Yeah. So the point that we're going to deal with, with it in here is we have, the men of Ephraim gathered together or were called together. Right. And went Zaphon northward to a place and said to Jephthah, why did you pass by us to fight against the children of Ammon? Even though they were called and they just chose not to come. Even though examining the message of July 18th, we made this open to all, but many did not wish to deal with it. They mm -hmm. did not want further to deal with the examination of these symbols. Mm -hmm. We will burn your house upon thee with fire. What kind of a threat is that? A mean one? Well, what happened in the days of Samson? It, it, it means to destroy. It would be a symbol like a false Holy Spirit or uh, burning or something not like it. No. Well, I mean, it would really be to destroy your message or your part of the movement or whatever you want to call it. Um, but let, let's just go back here. So one of the things that we're going to see that's important here when we when we look at this tomorrow is they are gathered at, um, they went to Zaphon. And Zaphon is a place along, uh, it's on the east side of the Jordan. And um, um, it's a place where um, in order to cross, the Jordan River and to, to travel into that area, they have to go through. So it's going to be that they're going to gather there. So it's a ford. Yeah, well, there's a ford. It's not so much a ford of, of um, yeah, there's a stream there. It's, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, so there's some disagreement about exactly the location. It's north of Gad and I don't know the name of this river. Um, so it names the river, but. Um, Jabbok? Yeah, well, it's near Jabbok. It's nearly five miles north of Jabbok. So, I mean, river strange locations here, but I'm going to have to look into that a bit more. But the idea here is that they're going to cross, and there, there basically is a place that they have to go through, and they're going to then be tested with this pronunciation of this word, shibboleth, which means um, a stream or a flood, right? Uh, flowing water, which is what they're going to have to pass over. So, so there's something there that I, I don't quite now know what it means, but um, we need to understand what it means. And it might have something to do with righteousness by faith. Because isn't that what's needed in order to pass over? I think that'd be correct. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so yeah. just as a taste, we have a lot to get into here in Judges 12. Yeah. Yeah, just, just the first seven chapters. So D Judges 12, verse 1 to 7 is the, the one. First seven verses, you mean? Yeah, first seven verses, that's what I meant, of chapter 12. Yeah. Okay, now does anybody else have any comment or question regarding what we've been covering today? Any other thoughts? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have spent together today. We thank you for this time that we have spent with you in our midst. Help us now, Father, to consider that which we have studied, to consider the points that we are seeing as they relate to the movement, as they relate to the message that we are to be given. Give us strength, Father, for this day. Help us so that we may be able to give your message, give your trumpet a certain sound, that we may be prepared for this message for it is to be the last message given to this world. We need your wisdom and we need your strength in order to do this and to do it right. Direct us today. May it be your character that others see. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.